Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. Over 11 years ago, I started the Radical Truth Podcast, and it's been an adventure. From having to learn how to speak to an audience without seeing their faces, to learning all the equipment, to building a recording studio in an RV. I have a video on doing that in YouTube. I've had to learn equipment and go through all kinds of headaches with that there, going through digital interfaces and microphones and just a host of different things of trying to do it until I found out a little bit of what I should be doing. But something I learned a long time ago when I was a young pastor in the streets of Detroit, Psalms 127 verse 1 said, Unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards a city, the watchman stays awake in vain. And the whole idea there is that God is the one that has to do the work, and if the work isn't done by him, then it's all worthless. And so that's been such a big thing in my life. I've wanted the work that I do, the ministry that I do, preaching and the podcasts and discipling, to all be something that is done through Christ, through the work of the Holy Spirit. And I have seen God do some wonderful things as a result. When I started this podcast, I began looking at revival, took probably about 11 weeks or so teaching on the subject. And there again, like I said in the beginning, I was just learning how to do this. And I feel now all these years later, I want to go back to the original subject I started with. I want to look at revival. We have just finished a study on the book of Acts, which was just wonderful to see the early church as a church that was defined by the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we need to be. We need to be a people that are defined by the Holy Spirit led by the Holy Spirit, filled by the Holy Spirit, walk in the Holy Spirit, and all the dimensions of the life in the Spirit. And so I want to return to revival, because revival is one of the greatest moves of the Spirit that we could ever see. It's the means by which the greatest evangelism can take place. The need is tremendous. It's something that God wants to do. It's something that he's always wanting to do, and he's waiting for his people to want it enough that they'll seek it and cry out for it, because he wants us to want it enough that we will treat it tenderly, correctly, that we will desire his presence and cherish the outpouring of his presence so much that we want to guard it through holiness and through the correct using of the, of the work of the Holy Spirit. The problem is that there's no experts on revival. The important thing is to understand our desperate need for revival and then pray like the eternity of multitudes hangs upon it, which it does. Revival is something that we need. God can do in a moment what the church can't do in a millennia. Until we understand that, we're going to keep doing church our own way. And when we do church our own way and not God's way, we're going to have our own results that are going to be very little and not very impressive in the scheme of eternity. Not only that, the very life of the church depends upon having fresh outpourings of the Holy Spirit to keep her awake and alive and expectantly waiting for the soon return of our Lord. This is something we need. It's not something that we just want, but the church needs this. Otherwise, we become spiritually dead and lukewarm, and we lose our passion for God and for God to move in revival and the saving of the lost. Psalms 80, verses 16 through 19, lays out the need of revival the one who revives, and how revival is necessary in the church. Let me read those verses to you. Verse 16, Your vine is cut down, it is burned with fire. At your rebuke, your people perish. Here's our desperate need for revival. We've been cut down, we've been rebuked, we're perishing. We need life. Verse 17 then says, Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of man you have raised up for yourself. This, of course, is a reference to Jesus, the one who revives, the one who brings life where there's been death, the one who restores that which has been consumed with the fire that destroys. Then in verse 18, then we will not turn away from you. Revive us, and we will call on your name. Here are two benefits of revival for the church. The first is that it will stop our backsliding, and second, It will breathe life in us so that we may passionately call on the name of the Lord. This is something we need right now. The church is in a backslidden condition by and large, and we need to have fresh life breathed in us that we might have the fire of the Holy Spirit burning through us. 
Then in verse 19, Restore us, O Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. This verse brings out the third reason why we are in desperate need of revival, that God would save us, that he would save his people. It's an old thought that comes out in revival. Before the lost can be saved, the church needs to be saved. Backsliders need to return and the lukewarm need to get on fire. How can we expect God to do something tremendous and wonderful among the lost if we are not letting him do it in the midst of the church? If the church hasn't been awakened, we can't expect that awakening to flow through the church to a perishing world. Those in the practice of sin must turn from their sin and the evil that they've led into their life and into their homes, the destruction that they brought to their marriages, and the ruin that they brought to other people through the sin that they practiced. Finney believed that revival was a science, and I understand why he believed that, but I don't necessarily agree with him. He believed that it was like farming. You take a seed, you plant it in the ground. That seed, if you water it and you tend it, is going to grow up and eventually it's going to produce a harvest. So it's a natural type thing that takes place. And he says, if we do this in the spiritual realm, we will see revival. So you just do these particular things. And if you do those particular things correctly, then you'll have revival. Now, Charles Finney was speaking out of his experience because he saw revival for 40 years. He was used in powerful ways throughout his whole life. Part of that was, I would say, it was the anointing that rested upon him. Another part was the message that he preached. And a whole other part was the message that the church and the world would be willing to receive, which they did. So he was a confrontational preacher that brought to bear the reality of the law that manifested the guilt of people's sin and called them to repentance. He saw tremendous fruit out of that. But the danger of this teaching, or let's say the danger of incorrectly believing it, is that we can trust in the science of revival and not in the God of revival. We can make it just some particular things that we do, and if we do these particular things, bam, we're going to have revival. Let me give an example of that. The Brownsville Revival, which took place in Pensacola, Florida, began in 1995. We became a part of that revival. And they went and had prayer meetings every week where the church would gather thousand plus people, and they would be praying over 12 different banners. And all the banners were is they were particular topics that the church could walk around the church and pray for five to 10 minutes at these banners, and they would be done praying after an hour or two. And it was powerful because it was focused prayer. But what people do after the revival broke out, they tried to get their own banners, and they put their banners in their church, and they tried to copy the revival, and then nothing happened. Or maybe there was a little bit of stirring in the church, but not revival is what was taking place with Brownsville. So they were trying to copy something and not birthing it in their own relationship with Christ and the life of the church. Before we can define what revival is, it will be very helpful for us to understand what revival is not. Now, Paul used this particular approach, such as in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The first three verses are what love is not. And then the following verses are, are about what love is. Before what love is could be properly taught, there had to be the dismantling of what love is not, because if it's not dealt with, then what happens is what love is just becomes perverted and twisted. So we have to dismantle the man-centered kind of love that we have so that we might learn how to love with agape love, with God's kind of love. And so the error has to be tore down before what is true can be built up. So to lower the standard of revival is a very dangerous thing because it will keep people from seeing the real thing. I have seen this so many times where churches have a low standard of what revival is. And so because they have a low standard of revival, when they think that they have had revival, they will not ever look for the real thing. I had resigned a church I was pastoring in Wisconsin and was starting to candidate at other churches. This is just before I accepted the call as an evangelist. And so what ended up happening was we went to this church and was candidating. It was a larger church in Alabama, and it was only about an hour away from the Brownsville Revival. And one of the first things I did when I talked to the board was if any of them had visited the revival in Brownsville. And they says, well, no, we haven't. We have our own revivals. Why do we need to go to Brownsville? And the point is because they had their cultural kind of revival which is they put up a sign and they have flyers that they put out and some advertisements on the radio and they say revival services for the next two weeks with so-and-so evangelists and they think they've had revival. And they do that once or twice a year and they think everything's okay. 
but they've never had the real thing because their standard is so low. All it is is a series of meetings. So if we don't dismantle the lies of revival or what revival is not, then we cannot understand what true revival actually is. Let's look at what revival is not. First thing, it's not a series of meetings like I just mentioned. Because a church puts up revival meetings because they put up a tent or because they rent a building doesn't mean they're having revival. They may be having evangelistic services. They may be having something trying to bring some kind of renewal to the church so that they have some fresh life. And I'm not saying those things are bad. It's just not revival. And if we settle for that as being revival, then we're never going to look for the real thing because we have such a low standard, we don't even know what the real thing is then. And revival is not evangelism or crusades or campaigns. And those can all be wonderful things, and I don't want to discredit them. Billy Graham was a wonderful preacher. He did a fantastic job. Tens of thousands of people were saved through his ministry. But he didn't bring revival. He brought evangelism. He brought crusades. And so they would be highly organized. He prepared the area before he came, send out people to churches and get people praying and asking for a move of God and get churches to do follow-up on the people that respond. When it was all said and done, the keeping rate was only at 5 to 7% of those who responded to the altar call. But when you go to revival, authentic revival, like the 1904 Welch Revival, they had a keeping rate of over 85%. You go to some revivals, like the 1859 Irish Revival, they had a keeping rate of near 100%. So when we look at revival and what revival does, what it accomplishes, we see something so much more powerful than just the evangelism that the church can do. The church should be telling people about Jesus and having every way that they can to try and reach out. But those expressions of evangelism should not take the place of authentic revival. Revival is not experiences, excitement, or enthusiasm. Yes, those will be in revival. Genuine revival is life, and when life comes to people, it is going to be something that's going to bring experiences and excitement and enthusiasm. But because people get excited and have some experiences doesn't mean that was revival. If that's all revival is, then we have missed the whole idea of what it is. Now, part of the problem is is how people define revival, and I'm not going to get deep into the word here, but they try and use the word in a very narrow way. So revive means that something had to be alive that died, and now it needs to be brought back to life again. That's true with what the word means. I don't want to diminish that. But yet when we look at the history of revival, we see something else that takes place at the same time. When the church comes alive, the lost are saved. And I believe if we do not see the lost saved, then we have not come into the place of true revival. Because it's not just about the experience. It's not just about the church getting excited. But when life comes into the church, the church is going to be reproducing that life in other people, especially in a perishing world. They're going to be longing for the lost to come to salvation. Revival is not about manifestations. Yet manifestations can happen in revival. And why do manifestations happen? I don't know. I would venture to say it is God coming down and these frail bodies just don't know how to deal with it. And sometimes it has some kinds of responses and and reactions to it. Sometimes it might be shaking or weeping uncontrollably. There are accounts of those who went into trances and all kinds of things that have taken place. And so I don't want to diminish what those are. But yet those who become hostile to the move of God because they attack manifestations, many times they're from the reform camps. And so you have this Puritan theologian. His name was Jonathan Edwards. He wrote a good book on manifestations and revival. And you know, he had this real problem because his wife had all these manifestations. And so he had to understand how God works in revival and there are manifestations. But not all revivals have manifestations. So they can be part of revival. They can be there. They can be the response of God doing some powerful things. But it doesn't mean that they have to be there. But if we make it all about manifestations, then the manifestations become what's important and we lose sight then of a true move of God. Revival is not about good worship or dancing down the aisles or whatever else may be going on. And those things may go on. I don't want to say that they're wrong. When God shows up, the worship is going to be wonderful because that's what's going to come out of people that have been awakened. And those who have been saved are going to be filled with joy and they're going to worship this God. So great worship is good. It's wonderful. But that's not evidence of revival. Revival is not renewal. Now, let me explain what I mean by this. Renewal, 
usually begins good. This the Spirit of God starts moving in a church, but over time it morphs into something that's not good. And the reason why it morphs into something that's not good is because it becomes internal. It's all about the church then. It's about experiences. It's about manifestations. It's about blessings. It's about personal words or whatever. All these things become so internal that they do not become external, reaching out to a perishing world. Revival is about reaching the lost, awakening the church to reach the lost. That's how it works. And so if you want revival, it has to be reaching out. It has to go beyond our own personal experience and the awakening we receive to have the life of the Spirit that comes through us, flows through us to those that are in need. It's also that revival is not a cure-all. If you think revival is going to solve all your church problems, it's not going to. If you think it's going to solve maybe your financial problems, it might. It may even just produce more financial problems because all of a sudden you have all these needs. Revival doesn't cure all problems. It does some things and other things it doesn't. One of the things that revival does, it does bring in a lot of people, but it also brings in a lot of people with a lot of trouble. So it causes the church a lot of mess. Revival is messy stuff because you're bringing into the church people that have all this mess. And yes, the power is there. God is changing lives, transforming lives, rescuing them out of the world, but they are coming in with all their mess and the problems and their relationships that have just caused all kinds of nightmares. And the church has to disciple. Revival does not disciple. The church must do the discipling. And revival does not build church structure that can sustain a move of God or help disciple the church. Revival is messy. Like I said, you're bringing people in that have all these issues and all these problems. And yes, there are the miracles that are transforming them, but there's still all that work. And then you have that issue that people think that revival is a cure-all. It's going to be nice and neat and orderly. And uh, there's never been a true revival that's been decent and in order from the way the dead church normally defines decent and order. Decent and order is a cemetery. All the little graves are all lined up in nice, neat little rows, and they're all dead. And there's a lot of churches out there that are totally dead. But if you start having resurrection power come and you start getting those dead people popping out of their graves, if people are not excited, they're still dead. When God brings life, there is evidence of life. The power of the Holy Spirit is working in their life, and there's going to be excitement. There's going to be things happening. There's going to be the messiness of people getting saved. There's going to be people responding that even don't know how to do it. And so you have all these dynamics going on, and the church is either going to do one of two things. When God starts to move, either they're going to pastor the move of God and allow the Holy Spirit to move and help people in that, or they're going to somehow shut it down. And they can shut it down in one of two ways. They can shut revival down by just not wanting anything of the messiness, or they can shut it down by letting it go wild and never pastoring it. Both aspects need to be dealt with. A move of God needs to be pastored by pastors that understand how to let the Spirit move and how to lovingly and correctly pastor the people so that the move of God can continue. That's why you can have some revivals that have gone on for five years, or like with Charles Finney, even up to 40 years. You have the East African revivals that went on for roughly 40 years, and there's other ones that have long-term effects because of what they did because they were pastored and they were dealt with in a correct way. So what is revival? It's a divine visitation. It's God's self-disclosure. It's God showing up and revealing himself to people in a sovereign and supernatural way. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. And those churches who don't want the work of the Holy Spirit, they will never see revival because they are keeping the very one that is the agent of revival out of the church. And so the Holy Spirit comes, and when the Holy Spirit comes, he does what he does. And I'll touch on that as these lessons go on on the subject of revival. Revival is a revelation of God's holiness, always, absolutely. And if the revelation of God's holiness is not there, then we need to step back and say, what is really going on here? Because more than likely, you either have renewal or you have some very great distortion because something has happened that the people have taken their eyes off of God and off of the reality that this is a holy God that causes people into a holy relationship. 
And so the revelation of God's holiness is going to do something. And what it's going to do, it's going to expose the terrible reality of sin. It's going to bring conviction. It's going to be profound, overwhelming conviction where people who may have never seen themselves as sinners before start seeing themselves as sinners. And maybe they knew that they were a sinner, but now they're seeing themselves as a sinner like they never saw themselves before. They are overwhelmed with their sin because they see their sin, an absolutely horrible, evil act against a holy, loving, merciful God. And so it produces terrible, intense conviction of sin. But it also, out of that conviction of sin, it produces deep, heartfelt repentance. That's what God's out after. That's what revival is all about. And so he brings that profound, terrible conviction of sin to get the church to repent of her sin and her rebellion and her compromise and her worldliness. And as he cleans up the church, then that Holy Spirit that is now in a holy people can flow through the holy people to a perishing world. And the conviction then starts falling on them, exposing their sin, helping them to see their need of repentance. So they're crying out, what must we do to be saved? And so you see revival brings this conviction that always brings repentance because repentance is the gift of God. It's the love of God. It's the most loving message we can see in Scripture because it is God coming to his people and to those who are not his people and convicting them of sin and showing them their need of repentance. And it's wonderful. It's powerful. It's beautiful. Tears of repentance are something beautifully attractive to God. It draws him to them even more so. And so what does this heartfelt repentance produce? It produces the fruit of repentance. Just like John the Baptist said when he was out there preaching in the wilderness, bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance. When repentance is in a life, the evidence of repentance is going to be there. That's going to be a transformed life. It doesn't mean that people won't struggle with those past sins, but it does mean there's a radical change inside of them where they're not giving themselves over to that sin like they did, and they're conquering it more and more until they are victorious over it. And so the fruit that comes out of repentance is not just the stopping or the ceasing of the practice of sin, but it's also the development of a Christ-like character, which is the fruit of the Spirit, such as is brought out in Galatians chapter 5. And so this fruit becomes wonderful. I mean, it gives life. It, It heals marriages. It changes people. It changes communities. It can even change nations. And so it always, like I said, begins with the church. So it's really the responsibility of the church to bring revival. It has always been that. God is the one who brings the revival, but he's looking for his saints to be the ones who seek it, who cry out for, who desire it, who want it, who prepare the way. And so it is new life. It's new life to the saved, and it's born-again life to the unsaved, where people are born again into the kingdom of God. Genuine revival always produces a radical change in the life. It brings transformation. It produces holiness. It takes people who are God-haters and makes them begin to love God and want to know him. It takes churches that were empty, and now they're being packed out because people are loving to be with God because they're loving the presence of God, and they're loving the move of the Spirit in the church, and they're pressing in more and more. Genuine revival always produces vibrant prayer and worship. These are fruits of revival. The more God moves, the more the church comes awake, the more she prays, and the more she worships. And yes, it is prayer that brings in revival, that produces revival. But when revival comes, guess what it produces? It produces life of prayer and a life of worship. It brings freshness to a church and to churches that have been dead for a long time. The church is then saturated with the glory of God. And when the church is saturated with the glory of God, then the glory of God flows through the church to a dying world. The church is in desperate need of this because the world is in desperate need of this. And even if the church were all to go to heaven when they die, the lost would go to hell. I mean, this is serious. So we need the work of God in our lives, in our churches, so that it can flow through us to a people that are rushing to hell. And so God's glory flows out of the church to the lost, to bring them to Christ. Revival births radicals and martyrs. Just look at the history of the church, and you will see this to be a fact of it. It's messy business. 
because people become radicals. They're ablaze with the love of God. They begin to spend themselves for the glory of God. They go to all parts of the earth. They go to parts of the earth where the gospel is rejected, and some are martyred for the cause of Christ. Others spend themselves and die in the midst of the work. You can look at that in the 1904 Welch Revival. That's a new enough revival that you can look at it. You can see how all these missionaries went out and all the work that happened. You can look at the Brownsville Revival and see all the missionaries that they sent out, many of them still out there in the field, still laboring because of the work that was done in that revival. And so as revival spreads, as it blossoms and becomes more and more powerful, churchmen become evangelists and converts become missionaries. It's just what happens. How can you be silent when the glory of God is being revealed? How can you be silent when his goodness is being poured forth in tremendous ways? How can you be silent when you start seeing people weeping at altars and they get off the altar and their life is absolutely revolutionized? Eternity invades the church when revival comes, and our lives begin to have all new priorities. When you look at the Welch Revival, and I'll bring that up again, the miners, they would come out of the mines, and they would go and clean themselves up a little bit and end up in church, and they'd go home at midnight or 1 or 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and be at the mine again at 5 or 6 in the morning. It was just this passion, this love for God that took these men out of the world and brought them into the fire, and they saw the relationship with Christ to be so beautiful, so wonderful. And so eternity invades the lives of people, and it makes people to have this fire. It produces a spiritual revolution in the life that then is producing a spiritual revolution through the life to others. And so the greater the revival, the more far-reaching the revival, the greater it transforms secular society. And so a local revival is going to have local results. A national awakening is going to have national results. There are accounts of revival that we can literally see the evidence of how it has changed the face of our nation. For years, it was Rome, New York, was classified as the safest city in the nation. And I read this many, many years ago in a Reader's Digest, and they gave the reason why Rome was the safest city in the nation, because of the revivals of Charles Finney 150 years prior. There is fruit that comes out of it. It can transform secular society. It can bring people to salvation that were criminals or just businessmen or lawyers or whatever. It revolutionizes them and changes their whole priorities of what they are living for and what they are doing with their life. It awakens in the church a missionary spirit where they want to start spending themselves for the sake of the lost, whether it is local or around their community, around their church, or in other parts of the world. But it awakens a missionary spirit. It produces a desperate hunger for God because when you have been in the presence of God and you have tasted of it, you have been enraptured by the wonder of God's love, then you keep hungering for it. That's why they keep going back to church. That's why with the Browns who revival, they would stand in lines to get into the revival 12, 24 hours ahead of the meeting because they were so thirsty and so hungry for the presence of God. You see, this should be normal Christianity. This should be New Testament Christianity. This is what the book of Acts was. When we're not like that, we are the distortion, the perversion of what the church is to be. That's not what God created the church to be, what we are now. When you look at the church in authentic revival, that's what he created to be. That's what he wants the church to be. And when the church is in revival, it always produces reformation. What is reformation? Reformation is restoring of truths that have been lost, whether through the abandonment of certain doctrines or the aspect that they are just not practiced or believed. Take hell for an example. People can believe in the reality of hell, but do they live like it exists? When God shows up and revival comes, people start seeing the reality of hell because they start understanding the reality of heaven. And now they're out there telling people because they don't want people to spend an eternity in hell when God is wanting to open up his heaven so wide that multitudes can come in. Revival is birthed through prayer, repentance, holiness, and a zeal for God. When the church is in apathy and indifference, there's no revival. It won't come. God will not bring it to a people who are indifferent and apathetic. He'll not bring it to a people that are spiritually lazy or so worldly they have no time for the things that really matter. But when people start understanding the value, when they start understanding what revival is all about and they start giving themselves over to it, then you can start seeing God begin to prepare people. Finney ended up saying that when you see the church at altars weeping for the lost, 
you know revival's getting ready to come. Why? Because God is beginning to move the hearts of the people that have been hard, and they're beginning to feel the reality of people that are rushing to hell, and their hearts are breaking over that. There is no hope for family, friends, our cities, and nation without revival. That's serious. No revival means that our loved ones will not be saved, that friends won't be saved, that cities and our nation won't be saved. The only hope we have for this country is that God would bring a national awakening. Apart from a national awakening, we are a nation on the way to judgment. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihp. M-I-N-I-S-T-R-Y dot com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. And thirst no more So come wash in the river Come drink your fill Let healing water